talk last about this comment by Tacitus. Do you guys remember that one? I'll take that as a yes. And where he made some statements that were uh, kind of interesting. First, he calls them that they're a class hated for their abominations. And then he ends up with that he accuses them of their hatred against mankind. Right? And so what I wanted to do was take some time this week to understand those comments. And, and so what we're going to do, um, if you look at your notes, we're going to start in actually chapter 7 um, and talk about the apologists, which will allow us to tie it into Tacitus a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk about the martyrs. Um, what you'll see is that while these are presented in chapters, and, and Gonzalez is a great book, um, it's, you know, he kind of breaks it into pieces, which you have to do, right? But history is a continuous spectrum. So a lot of the stuff, as we mentioned at the very beginning, overlaps with each other. So it's not that this happened and then chapter 6 happened and then chapter 7 happened, right? He's not doing it sequentially. He's taking it topical. So chapter 6, we talked about uh, martyrs. In chapter 7, we talked about apologists. Those people lived at the same time. In fact, some of the martyrs were apologists, right? So they were really happening at the same time. Um, and so some of the attitudes, so as Tacitus writes, the Roman historian, as he writes at the same time as the apologists are trying to defend the faith, which is the same time that people are getting martyred, which is the same time as we'll see, um, Rick gets the exciting stuff talking about Arrhenius, where you start seeing doctrine really starting to establish things that you would actually recognize. Because as we talk about some of the things today from Justin Martyr, you're going to say, was that guy really saved? And we will talk about that a little bit, because he was. But it's different, and we have to understand where they were at at the time to understand who they were, okay? And that'll be something I think we will all have to grow in a little bit is giving these guys some grace, letting them be who they are, where they're at, at the time that they're at. Because we look at this through our 2,000 years of established doctrine, standing on the shoulders of a Martin Luther and a John Calvin and all these guys, they didn't have that, much less a printing press or an internet, right? So they had to deal with what they had to deal with. And, they ha and, and these were faithful men that stood for what they had at the time that they had. So that was, we'll talk some more about that, all right? So where do we start? Um, we're going to start talking a little bit about persecution, all right? Early, we'll start with apologists. Apologists. Um, what is apolo apologetics? What's that? Defense of, Defense of the Christian faith in front of what? What are you defending it from? Any accusations. Accusations, questions, right? Clarifications, things like that. So why would they need that? I mean, wasn't didn't everybody know what Christianity was? I mean, it was pretty obvious, right? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Who are, where were people at? And, and a lot of this stuff is coming from um, Rick's ancient Near Eastern philosophy notes that he's been teaching us all the time from Thursday. Um, let's see, how can we move in? There's two seats up here. We can move some people over there if you want to. Oh, okay, let me get. Okay, Rick, can you move my stuff out of the way, please? And then move that plot while I'll show you. Thanks. All right. Um, what was the system, or, or what are most man created systems about? Let's talk about that. Uh, how man gets to God. Right. How man gets to God. How many systems are there? There's a million of them, right? <laughs> as many men have as ideas, there's a man-centered system, right? What are some of the ideas of those man-centered systems? Because there actually aren't that many, as weird as that sounds. Good deeds, Good deeds okay. What do they think about God? Where do they get their impressions about him? They think of him in human terms. Why is that? Yeah. Can you think of a color that's not a color? Why is that? Because you're limited. You can only think of things for a certain distance, right? Think of a shape that's not a shape. All those kind of similar things that are silly questions that we can't do, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You start talking to these data scientists that start talking about N space and all the other things. Whatever. Anyways, you can't think beyond what we're limited to, and that's okay. But when we start thinking about God, what do we start doing with that same mentality? Well, we start creating God in our own image because that's all we have to go on. 
right? And that's, in some ways, that's okay because God created us to be limited. Now, when we start saying, God, you're limited too because I'm limited, that's where we start going too far, right? Now we've gone too far. Now we're starting to impress upon God. What are we doing? We're creating God in our own image or in images of things that we understand. So what did Roland say they started to do? They created God, four-footed things, images of their own. That was what happened, right? That's why it all happened. All right. Now, but going a little bit further, let's think about Roman culture. Let's think about um, well, the force. Let's talk about all these other things that we, we kind of used to. What were their gods like? Zeus, Hermes, Zeus. Artemis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like superheroes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were human. But mm -hmm. they were more geometric than physical. Well, if you, yeah, yeah, they were. Why was that? They have passions. They were kind of superhero-ish. Which, what's a superhero? Very man. Yes, very powerful man. So they were limited geographic. Why is that? Because they're not really gods. Well, they're not really gods, right? <laughs> they're like us. We took our images, heightened them a little bit, and said that must be a god. Why did they do that? Because can we can, can we explain everything? Well, of course not, right? So we have to find something to explain it. So we come up with this silliness that is a god, right? Now, if they're going to be like us, what else are we going to do? What are key things that most people have in our society? Do you have to eat? So what do you gods have to do? What else? What's a huge thing in almost every culture? Procreation. Procreation. So what do your gods have to do? Procreate. Make some great stories. I grew up, uh, as most of you know, I grew up uh, with Hindu stories from my family. And they were just great stories about the stars and how the stars had to do this so that Vishnu could, could come to see Krishna and Krishna would do this and then that. They had a kid that became this and, and it was an elephant with six arms and all that kind of stuff. That was kind of weird, but it was very entertaining, right? <laughs> um, it all had to happen because they saw, they saw their gods through their own lens. And so they saw him. They saw them growing. They saw them changing. They saw them procreating. They saw them eating. They saw all kinds of things. And keep that in mind because as we get into this, as we start talking about Gnosticism, well, who in the world would ever believe that stuff? It does make sense, right? If you think of gods in your own image, as you think of how you're trying to get there, if you, if I'm thinking of the Force in Star Wars, what's the Force? What controls the Force? Whatever I think is right now, right? I mean, he just totally makes it up. It doesn't make any sense. It's one way one time and one way or another. The force will help you. The force will be with you. But then it's an impersonal force that's just in everything. So I mean, it just makes no sense. We're just making it up as we go. So why is Gnosticism appealing? For the same reason that anything else is appealing, right? And then when we start mixing it with Christianity, things go downhill. All right. So what do we see? We see that creation is an outworking of the God's reproduction, okay? But they're also subject to the same rules that we are. Um, since things are unexplained, obviously the gods have the power to change that. But they are just like us. They have to be fed. They have passions that they need to be satisfied. They have, um, if we don't satisfy them, what's the possible outcome? Wrath. Wrath. Against them. Right. What happened? Think about Elijah. What did he want the, the prophets to do? You remember? Elijah. Was Elijah and Elisha? Well, Elijah. 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 Yeah. So he kept calling him down. And so, what did they start doing? What did those people start doing? All the prophets. Cutting, Cutting themselves, dancing around, right? Doing all kinds of lewd things. What were they trying to do? Yeah, yeah. What were they trying to do? Mm. Trying to appease him? Keep going. They were trying to get his attention. They were trying to fire him up. They were trying to get him excited. They were trying to do everything they could to get him interested. Mm. Right? So they were doing all these things, the dancing around, the cutting themselves, the chanting, and all the other things that they would have been doing were all to get the God to do what? 
to get him interested. My children do the same thing. When they want me to take some place, I've never had children more obedient and friendly. Why? What do we call that? Manipulation. Manipulation. <laughs> right? That's what they were trying to do. But the thing is, is even they cut their throats. Yeah. So to a degree, they're trying to manipulate. They want somebody to like them. They want, s- whether it's the way you dress, whether it's the way that you act. I mean, the biggest, uh, many of you have kids, the biggest thing that you have a hard time with as they grow up, I know because I share it, is that convincing them that they are their own people. And they don't have to try to be friends with everyone else. They don't have to be liked by everyone else at all costs. That doesn't make any sense. But this is the way that people view God typically. Why do people go to church on just Easter and Christmas? Because I can manipulate God to like me if I go on all the right days. Right? That's the way it works. That's the way most of the world works. If you get out of the United States especially, most of the world works by manipulation. Bribery, special favors, paying it back. This whole idea of a blind justice system is very Western and it's disappearing in a hurry to be replaced with what the rest of the world already knows and always has. Okay? Position is bought, not earned. Okay, so that's the way we treat our God, right? I want to be good with God. I got to get good with God. I, I have to convince him that it's worth his time to make the crops grow, to give me children, to do whatever else. So I'm manipulating him. And so I relate to him the same way I relate to so many others, right? Because I got to convince him to help even if he's not interested. Okay. Here's the rub. Who is the God of the Bible? What is he like? Why not? That's the problem, right? Christians believe in a single God who is not connected to this creation. So if I sacrifice to him, does it change him? Does it impress him? Does it appease him? Does it feed him? Can, be, can he be incited by my dancing around? Can he be incited at all? Oh, yes. <laughs> that was a trick question. <laughs> Why is it a, f- a scary thing to fall into the hands of an angry God? Why does he burn with jealousy over his people? God is not stoic. That'll be something else we'll talk about, right? That's an important thing. This is a God who has emotions, right? He is real, but he's transcendent, he's omnipotent, and he's omnipresent. He sees everything, he knows everything, and he's above everything. He's not subject to it. Now, we just talked about a whole set of creation who believes that God is subject to the same rules they are, and the Christians come and say, no, he has actually no connection to this world. Does that kind of break some of your foundation? Does that change the way you view God? Is it a departure? on the way that most of the world sees God. Compare the Christian God in his omnipotence and his transcendence to most other systems in the world. And what do you find? Is this making sense? Am I, this is confusing you? Or are we going too slow? Um, I mean, I just wrote down a few thoughts. He brings everything to pass on his good pleasure, not because of what you do. Um, He is transcendent and yet personal. He numbers the hairs on your head. He knows all your ways. David said, where can I go? If I go down to the depths of the sea, you're there, right? Um, His direction reveals his character. Why are you supposed to be holy? Because he is holy. Yeah. You are supposed to walk in his ways because they are his ways. And you are subject to him. That's just the end of the story. Right? So his direction, uh, he gives the source of truth. He is the source of truth. He defines reality. He says what is true, and we follow that. It's not that he's subject to some greater concept. He defines it. And keep that one in mind next week as we start talking about Gnosticism. Because that has all kinds of spheres of things that you're supposed to attain to. And each of these gods contains another sphere. It's the most bizarre thing in the whole world. But people love that kind of stuff. 
because they can see it. Uh, we were created for a reason. We're not just a byproduct of some God reproduction. So um, basically, we think uh, God is everything that he's not. We create idols. Uh, we ascribe power to the wrong things. We believe too much in our own power and determinism, and we define our own truth. We do everything that God is not. So what happens in the Bible? As you read through the book of Isaiah, as we're finishing up on Thursday night, as you read through Exodus, and we talk about those miracles that Moses did. Exodus, yeah, Exodus, right? What was special about those miracles? Besides that they were miracles. I guess I'm making this special by itself. But what, what, why, was, why did he pick those particular seven miracles? Right. Each of those things that he picked actually were targeted towards a, a core Egyptian god. And then the Pharaoh lots of gods. A core Egyptian god. So the frogs, that was for some odd reason, was a god in Egypt. Um, all those things that he does, he's showing that his god has power over all of their gods. Right. That was why those miracles were chosen. They weren't just random. They weren't just parlor tricks. They were actually like specifically chosen things to do to show and most of the Bible I'm finding is God trying to convince people and don't take that word literally but basically putting evidence before people that he is greater than anything they have a concept of because if you read Romans if you read these books where do we trend we trend to make God in our own image and so God spends most of his time in the Bible showing you how he's not that God he is his own God and he is transcendent, and he is great, and he is worthy of worship. Not to manipulate you, but to defend his own character. That's who God is. That's a lot of what the Bible is about. And when we get that, when we see that, that's when we start becoming Christians. Does that make sense? The reason we're spending a lot of time on this is not so that I can sit there and do an apologetics class right here. It's so that we can start talking about where they were at this time. This is the culture that these Christians are coming up in. They see this, and they put names on them now. So now it's Zeus. Uh, is it? Zeus for Roman? Man. What was it? Zeus for Jupiter, Greece? Jupiter for? Jupiter for Rome. I don't, get, I don't really care either. But this is Jupiter for Romans, um, Artemis, Diana, one of the two, Mars and Aries. Yeah, see, I got you. So those are all the things that they put names on, right? If I go over to India, it's, it's uh, Krishna and Vishnu um, and uh, so many of these other ones. If you go into uh, other cultures, they all have them. If you go into pantheistic cultures, what do you have? The lion means this, the bear means that, you know, the elk is this. It's all something. It's just different names for the same stuff, right? But that was the culture that they grew up in. That was the culture that Christianity comes up in. The only distinct culture that's slightly different is Judaism. And Judaism is the thorn in the side, which we'll come back to later. For now, they're going to fade off into the distance. But for the most part, Christianity is growing up in this pantheistic, atheistic society. Does that make sense? So, now, why then... Why then would Tacitus refer to the Christians as an abomination? What's an abomination? Something that's offensive. Something that's offensive. Way out of place. Something that almost everyone finds abhorrent. Okay. Why would they find them abhorrent? Mm-hmm. One God, that's bad enough. What else are you saying? Uh, yeah. So where do the rest of the gods fall into? <laughs> they don't exist. Your statues are just your statues. Oh wait, I feel like I've read that somewhere in the Bible. Hmm. Right? What about their hatred of mankind? Now this is going to be a little bit more um, difficult. Um, wh where do the Christians come from in general in the society? Think First Corinthians. They're not angry with the fact that they were all Jews. Right. What does What does Paul talk about in First Corinthians? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
How many of you are wise? How many of you are basically, how many of you are the elitists? How many of you can sit around and just spend your days thinking? They couldn't. They had to work. So it appealed to more of the lower classes. Well, why is that? Who were the lower classes? Think of your Gospels. Who did Jesus go to? Shepherds. 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 Prostitutes. Shepherds. Tax gatherers. Not the elite. And why is that? Well, he sent his people up to invite them to the wedding, and they rejected it. So he went to the highways and the byways. The guys that lived along the streets. Right? So that's who he's bringing in. And Christianity continues to appeal to those people. Now, what does that tell you if you're a Roman and you're saying, well, I've got all these high philosophers and they're not buying into this and the only people that are are the prostitutes. What are they going to think about Christianity? Hmm, yeah, it's probably not going to look that great on the surface. Right? Now, if you looked at what was happening to those people, that would be your miracle. But if you just looked at the surface and said it's only appealing to this, the scum on the street, I'm not impressed. Just not impressed. There must not be anything there. Right? Uh, second, the, were they um, what was one of the things that they were told to do is ab- avoid, avoid the gods. Why is that? Did they believe in the gods? No. Did they go into the temples to worship? Therefore, where was the center of life in Roman culture? In Indian culture. In Indian culture, it's the temples. It's the temp- Everywhere it's the temples. Buddhist temples, Hindu temples, Roman temples. They're all temples. Muslim temples. Muslim temples. Um, Jewish. That's a little different. <laughs> Jewish temple. Jewish temple was, yes, there's a pattern to it, right? Life is spent around this religious place where you go meet with your gods. And now, all of a sudden, you become Christian, and what do you start avoiding? those places you're not there anymore but now you're going further because what happens at the end of romans you stop buying the meat because it was sacrificed to idols and so now you're not interacting with the common way of doing business and then you're starting to do other things where you're just because you know what happened to the temples in some cases how did you encourage fertility Right? You incited your gods. You went and you had sex in the temple with a temple priest so that you could incite the god to give you fertility in your own life. It all makes perfect sense. If your assumptions are in the right place, it all makes perfect sense. Right? But now the Christians are not doing this anymore. They're not coming to these places. They're not paying their tithe. They're not paying their... Uh, They're not going to see the temple priestess. They're not doing all these things. So what's now happening is they're not participating in the normal things. So what does Tacitus say about the people, the Christians? They hate mankind. Why do you hate us? Plus, you're not doing these things. And if you don't do these things, what are the gods going to think? They're going to get angry. Now you're going to bring the wrath of everything down on us because you guys aren't participating with the rest of us. You're an abomination. We hate you. The gods hate you. Everybody hates you. This is what the culture was. Now imagine you walk out this door, and here we have a nice church of 400 people. Imagine you met in a place where there was 10 of you, and when you went out the door, everybody was staring at you because everybody knew you. Remember, the churches at that time weren't big buildings like this. They were small house churches that appealed to regional people because you couldn't travel that far. And if you were working, it's not like you really had mass transportation. So you went to small regional areas of worship where everybody knew you. That's why it was hard to hide if you were a Christian. Everybody knew who you were. You worked there. You lived there. You probably grew up there. Half the people around you might even be your own family. They knew when you were Christian, it was different, right? So you walked out that door and you saw, and everybody said, oh, there goes the hatred of mankind, right? Um, They won't participate in anything. They won't do anything that we do. They won't go to the temple priest. They won't go to um, these uh, functions. They won't go to the, uh, the games. They won't even enter military service. Why wouldn't they enter military service? 
and this is going to be harder for us. Good. Keep going. What's a king? No. Romans 13 makes that pretty clear what they're supposed to do. Why do they struggle? <coughs> um, let's go to this. Uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Peter goes out. He's given a shield. What's on the shield? A lion. Why was the lion on the shield? That's Aslan. What was the connection? No. No. It was what he is supposed to his allegiance upon. So if I did that and I put the sign of the emperor on, what am I saying about the emperor? Yeah. Think Egypt. What was Pharaoh? He was a god. A god. What was, what was at this point, what did Caesar become in the empire? At least what did Caesar believe of himself? Yeah. Right. And so if you're in the military, guess what you were required to do? <coughs> allegiance. For more than allegiance, you worshipped the emperor. So why wouldn't Christians join in the military? They couldn't do it. So that little symbol on their shield was not just a symbol, an indicator. It wasn't just what we put on our NFL helmets, right? This was a symbol of who you were and what god you fell under. So guess what? I get Constantine. This is weird. This is really cool because Constantine's an interesting guy. Guess what Constantine does when he becomes Christian? He puts the cross on his shield. Right? So that tells you something. It all goes together. That's the great thing about history. So Christians won't do any of this stuff. They won't go participate. They won't go have any fun. They won't go do the things that we do. They won't join in military service. They won't worship our gods. They're, they are an abomination. We hate them. They're horrible. And their God doesn't even make any sense, right? Because think about this, God. Your, your God just doesn't even make any sense. First of all, let me say, he's not involved in creation, but he gets involved with creation anyways. He's omnipotent, but then... He can't stop bad things from happening to his people. Does that sound at all familiar? So he, um, he sets the world in motion, but then takes his time to come in and count the number of hairs on your head. Doesn't he have anything better to do with his time? Look at our gods. Our gods are busy. Your god apparently can't get his nose out of your own business. He watches everything you do. But <laughs> what do our gods do? Our gods are too busy having fun in their own stories. They're as sinful as we are. But your God, for some reason, is not sinful, but he's, and he pays attention to everything you do, keeping track of all your sins. Doesn't he have anything better to do with his time? Can't he find something else to do? And Wait, you're saying I can't connect to him? I can't do anything to make him change? But at the same time, he listens to my prayers? Is this... Do you see how this doesn't make any sense to them? They're used to a God they can manipulate. And here the Christians are saying, no, you can't manipulate him, but he does want to hear about you. Um, he's high and above you, but he cares about everything you do. Does that make sense? It shouldn't. And they couldn't compute it either. And to be quite honest with you, most people in any culture at any time okay, um, don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It shouldn't make sense. It doesn't appeal to our natural inclinations. That's what makes us sinners. This God does not make sense to us. All right? That was embarrassing. And that was on camera, too. So now I'm going <laughs> to... Uh. Where were we? All right. Oh, the resurrection. Yeah. So let me get this straight. Your God is high and above creation, but then he decides to come as a person. Right? He's omnipotent, and then he comes as a person to redeem people. And then this resurrection of yours just doesn't make any sense. What happens if you get burned? Exactly how are you going to get a new body? I mean, does not make any sense? What's he going to do? Give you this old, decrepit, burned up, like, mummy body? body? You know, it just They couldn't compute it because it just didn't make sense to them. And then now you guys go and have these things called love feasts. We have love feasts, too, with the temple priestess. That's what we call it, right? So you Christians, man, you guys don't make any sense. Don't even get me started on this whole body and blood thing that you guys do every week where you eat a baby or something and chop it all up and share it and say you're sharing in the body and blood of your state. 
it doesn't make any sense. Your God is just creepy and weird and doesn't make any sense. This is the society that Christians are growing up in. This is the society that our children are starting to grow up in. So Christianity doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense. We're returning quickly to this kind of mentality where things don't get it. Okay? Now, to all this, why do we spend all that time on it? I want to spend time on it because that's the society that we're going to be understanding. As Rick takes on Gnosticism and Marcion and some of these other guys that are going to come up, that is what they're thinking. That's where they're starting. Their systems of understanding the world are Plato and Aristotle and um, uh, Stoicism and Gnosticism and these things that try to explain these things and take all these concepts that we just talked about in different forms and they twist them and they turn them, but they're all the same. They're all about you manipulating situations to get to where you want to be because this God is no, not much better than you, right? And that's where we're going to go. Now, in our lesson, though, we're going to talk about these apologists that come around. Apologists were guys that tried to explain the Christian faith. So they defended the resurrection by explaining God's omnipotent. He can create a new body if he wants you to have a new body. Right? They, they talked about, they clarified what the whole symbol was um, of communion. Right? They talked about the immorality, your love feasts. Right? And this is what was interesting is they took, um, they talked about, well, you guys won't go into the military because you won't worship. And they said, look, you think we're immoral. You think that we have love feasts. You think that we're cannibals because we eat babies. And let me ask you something look at the lives of these people. Look at the lives of the people that are becoming Christians. Well, who do you think is really acting immoral? And what they did was they appealed to the character of the Christians to defend the fact that Christianity wasn't moral. How many of us would say, let me show you if God is right. Watch me. Watch my life. Watch how I live. Watch how I act. Tell me if there's not a transformation from what was before. Let me show you with my life what's true. How many of you have put yourselves out that way? Yet that was the argument of, the, of one of the arguments of the apologists. You think that we're not acting moral because we're not going to the temple. Let me ask you, look at our lives. Now look at the people that are going to your temple. Who would you say is acting more moral? And that shut a lot of people up. In fact, that actually led to the conversion of Justin Martyr. He talked to a Christian, saw the lives of these Christians, and realized, those guys have the truth. These guys in Rome don't have anything. This guy has everything. And he was converted. Okay? So they would come back and they would try to show, uh, uh, explain the truth, explain the Christian faith to, to the people in the culture. Does that make sense? That's what the apologists did. Now, how do you do this, though? This is what becomes harder. What are two paths? If you read the book, um, Gonzalez boils it down to basically two different tactics. If you wanted to take on your culture, oh my God. Um, <laughs> if you had to take on your culture, how would you do it? So on one hand, you could try to build a bridge, right? This is guys like Justin Martyr. What they wanted to do is acknowledge uh, that there was some philosophy, some wisdom uh, in culture that was common, what we would call common grace here, right? That they kind of knew something, that there was something there. And, and Justin Martyr was actually a great um, example of this. He uh, came from the school of Plato, which I think is something with start with a hypothesis and work your way down, I forget. It's the opposite of Aristotle. Okay. Um, and he met a Christian, he heard about the Old Testament, we just talked about that. So he ditched his Plato, and he starts traveling to explain. And he was eventually martyred in 165 AD. Now, his opinion was that the Greek philosophers borrowed from the Old Testament. And where he gets this is this idea that um, <laughs> there's a logos. There's something that everybody knows. And what happens is um, 
it's the origin of all things. Uh, there's life beyond. He actually believes that there was a logos. It was inside of all men, but this light has been dimmed. Okay. So where does he get this? Why does he think this? Christ was the light of all men. He was like going to John 1. You can really bend yourself and twist yourself in a lot of different directions if you take it out of context. And he took it out of context. So he tried to convince him that the logos that the Greek philosophy talked about is the same thing as the logos of Christ. Well, why would you think that? Because he uses the same word. It's actually not a trick question. John actually describes him as the logos. Now, John was redefining the logos. That's what was key. Justin didn't get that. He said, you've got a logos, we've got a logos, they're the same thing, you guys just don't see it clearly. Right? And so he starts saying, you, you have to depart. Um, by departing from the single true God, this light was dimmed, but it's still present. So every man has a little bit of the logos, a little bit of Christ inside them. Do you see where this is starting to go astray? Um, so therefore, what you have to do is get rid of this idea uh, of multiple gods and come to a single true monotheistic view of Christ um, to be able to reunite with the logos and uh, be saved. I'm not going to go into all this here. I've got more. We don't have time. Um, if it doesn't make sense, it won't. Don't, don't try. Okay? He's making stuff up. And what he's really trying to do is he's trying to take Stoicism, Gnosticism, Greek philosophy, Plato, and a lot of other things, and he's trying to combine them with Chris, similar Christian elements. And what's he trying to do? Why would he do that? He's not being um, heretical. He's trying to get them to think. He's trying to get them to show that Christianity does actually have some intellectual merit. In fact, it has a lot of intellectual merit. In fact, it makes more sense than any of your systems. And he's trying to help them to see, get from here to there. He's trying to build that bridge. He's trying to do what the four laws of, uh, of uh, what would I take this? Four spiritual laws. So what they're trying to do. He's trying to put it into a nutshell, trying to help them understand Christianity. He's trying to come to them with the gospel. The problem is he starts saying, well, if everybody's got the Lagos, then that means guys like Aristotle and Plato that came before Christ must have had some of the Lagos, which makes them <laughs> Christians. There's a reason why Dante put Greek philosophy at the top level of hell. A little bit of heresy. A little bit of error, right? That's all right. What was the big deal? How do we know that Justin was a Christian? He believed in a monotheistic God. What was the biggest thing that he could depart from in his society? The idea that there's a pantheon of gods. And he clung to this idea. He started abandoning Stoicism. And he came to the idea that there's just one God and it is Christ and he was sent and I am, he is my redeemer. And he clung to that. In his writings, he clings to that. The rest of his theology is kind of funky, but man, he was clear that that's what he believed. And you could tell that that changed his life, and eventually he was martyred for it. Okay. Now, what's the other way you can go after society with your apologetics? You can build the bridge, or you can destroy the bridge. You can just do a straight-on <laughs> frontal attack. What you think is stupid. Okay, it's totally garbage. Um, Tertullian said, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? What does the academy have to do with the church? Basically, what do you, with your Greek philosophy, have anything to do with Christianity and its doctrine? What am I trying to tell you to do? Abandon what you know and come to the truth. There is no good in Greek philosophy. In fact, his argument went on to say, or I guess this is Tatian. Tatian's argument was, look, if we really look at Rome and what they know, they really got, um, let's see, they got math, uh, astronomy from the Babylonians, geometry from the Egyptians, writing from the Phoenicians. So really, Rome doesn't have any original thought. All they do is they take old stuff and repackage it and claim it as their own and take success stories from it. Well, the Old Testament is before Rome. It has the truth. Therefore, what should you listen to? What predated Rome. Roman philosophy will get you nowhere. So therefore... Here's the truth. 
Abandon what you know and come to this truth. Is that good? See, if I do this other thing, if you would do this exactly. other thing, instead of having that be my plan and not give in my childhood, what if I gave you the law and that's totally wrong? Yeah. And yep. I know it's probably the reason you're doing it that is because right. God is trying to give you more. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's elements of both, and some people need more of the abandon everything you know and come to Christ. Other people want to establish the truth. And what we find is the church will be filled throughout its time with both extremes, if you will, because it needs a little bit of both. It needs a little bit of both. There is wisdom in this world. Is it Christianity? No. Is there wisdom in this world? Yes. Paul came and said, let me tell you about this statue that you say to the unknown God. He builds a bridge. On the other hand, be transformed by the renewing of your mind means leave it all behind. Don't take it with you. Don't try to synchronize it all either. So Tatian kind of went over here, and Justin Martyr kind of goes over here, and what happens is both of them cause problems eventually. But for the time that they had to be in, that's what the society needed. That's what Christianity needed. They needed hardcore guys that were convinced of the truth, that were convinced that this Christ was true, that were convinced that monotheism is real, that were convinced that the scriptures were accurate, and that Roman philosophy should be left behind in favor of Christianity. That's what they needed. They needed guys that would stand up for the faith. And these guys were martyred for their, for their faith. All right? Um, all right. We're going to stop there. And we're going to spend the next few minutes on some early martyrs. Now, um, everybody has an agenda. Let me ask you this. Most of the persecutions, in fact, most of the persecutions throughout history, I'm going to go out on a limb. Most of the persecutions in history, are they about Christian doctrine? In the Bible, you learn things over. Over doctrine. What are most persecutions about? Really? Are you suggest are you suggesting that Hitler was after the Jews because he didn't like their religion? Hmm? Okay, keep going. What's the point? Scapegoat? Scapegoat. Good. Power scapegoat it has nothing to do with worship no. I don't care about your worship no. most persecutions not all most persecutions are because of some political or economic end the yeah, crusades <laughs> okay but it has nothing to do with the religion they could care less what your religion was that's why persecutions break out across a lot of things the Jews weren't the only ones that Hitler went after. He went after the Christians, too. That was just an easy switch. The Native Americans ch- went after a lot of people. The Mayans went after indiscriminately a lot of religions, a lot of people groups. Persecutions break out for a lot of reasons, and they're generally not about religion. Same thing is true here in Christianity. When persecutions broke out in the first century, it was very little to do with their doctrine and more to do with the fact that I want things the way I want them, and I'm using my religion and your religion as my excuse to come and power you, which is, I think, what you're probably getting at. Right? That's just the difference I need to excuse the fact that I can persecute you for being different. Right? It could be your blue eyes. It could be a lot of other things. But in this case, I'm just going to choose your religion. And why would I target Christians? We've already learned a number of them. Nobody likes them. And at this point, how many are there? Few. And where do they come from? What society? What portion of society? Low. So are they going to fight back? No. See, this is a pretty safe bet that I can go after these guys with little consequence. Right? And yet, like a cockroach, they just can't seem to get rid of them. (laughs) And so, guess what? You start pending up all of this anger because not all the Christians dealt with this properly. And then this guy Constantine comes in, and Constantine says, let's make this a state religion. Now, it's legal, and everything else is not legal. Now what's, what are the Christians going to do to you, the ones that maybe aren't quite as filled with grace? 
the tables are turned. Here we go. Right? The Emperor has risen again. So, that's kind of all. All right, early martyrs. So, as they're going through, we know from um, Peter that these persecutions were going, but the reason that they weren't necessarily enterprise, that they weren't entire empire wide, was because they were politically motivated for a time being. So, what you see is persecutions come up and they drop. Sometimes more severe, sometimes less severe, a lot of times very regional. Usually they, they didn't live past one generation of king or emperor or whoever it was that was doing it because once that agenda went out the door, so did the persecution. The persecution was not the point. The agenda was the point. The persecution just happens to be the vehicle. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Which so really stinks. Yeah, yeah. Pilate wanted to keep his job, so he gave Christ over to the Jews. It's actually a, maybe a more particular example. But yeah, a lot of that. Or um, as we talk about Marcus Aurelius, he believed, and it'll come back up with Justinian and a few others, he believed in the greatness of the Roman Empire. We got to establish the Roman Empire. I mean, the way we establish the Roman Empire is to establish the Roman religion because we're only as good as our gods. Back to that argument, right? And if I want to manipulate the gods, then i got to convince them we're all for them. And to convince them we're all for them is to get rid of the people that are against them. So what am I going to go do to the Christians? I'm going to go get rid of them. Not because I particularly hate the Christians. I'm just trying to establish Rome as superior. And these Christians are in the way. It's going to keep coming up over and over again. That's what happens a lot through these first couple centuries. So it was very uh, agenda-oriented. It was politically mo motivated, which really stinks because that means that there was a lot of Christians that were killed for no other purpose than the king's whim. You know, to, but they stood fast. They stood fast. Now, the uh, the policy in Rome generally came from a guy named Pliny, Pliny the Younger, not to be confused with Pliny the Elder. Um, <laughs> Pliny the Younger, he was actually a, a, a decent leader. He was just. Um, in his area, he actually ruled over an area called Bithynia. Does that sound familiar? First Peter one one. Um, so he actually had a decent number of Christians in his in his society. In fact, so much so, he wrote that the pagan temples are starting to become abandoned because so many Christians are coming to faith in his area, and people are coming to faith in his area. So he starts persecuting them as was the practice because they were an illegal religion. But he's starting to get so many of them, he's starting to question, is this even right? I mean, he's kind of determined to be just. He starts listening to their arguments. He can't find any real reason. They're not rebelling against the state. They're not causing any trouble. They're paying their taxes. These are good people that you can't figure out why he's persecuting. So he stops. He writes to Trajan, who was the emperor at the time. And he says, what am I going to do with these guys? Because they really haven't done anything wrong. And we're spending an inordinate amount of time going after these guys for no particular reason. And Trajan agrees with him. So Trajan writes back and says, yeah, you're right. They're really not a threat. They're really not a threat to the society, or to the empire. Okay. And why does that matter? Because the empire at this point is starting to become undone. And the empire is having to decide where it wants to pick its battles. And right now the barbarians are going to start becoming more and more of an issue. Barbarians are anyone that's not Roman. And they're starting to have to deal with this. And Trajan's sitting there saying, do we really want to fight a war on the inside? Not really. So here's the deal, Pliny. Here's what I want you to do. If they're not causing problems, just ignore them. But they are at the same time still not obeying the government. They are not part of the state religion. So we got to protect the superiority of the government. So if they don't do anything, if you don't notice them, let them go. Just let them be their Christian selves, right? But if somebody stands up and accuses them, then you got to persecute them, prosecute them. That, so it was the equivalent of a don't ask, don't tell. Right? So as long as you could be a Christian, but as long as you didn't gather any attention to yourself, you were okay. But if somebody stood up, and all they had to do was stand up and say, that guy's a Christian, that was enough to be guilty. Okay? To prove your guilt. Now, Irenaeus will take issue with that. <coughs> if it's not enough of a threat, without an accusation, why is it a threat with an accusation? If it's fine to be this way at some times, but not others, that's a problem, okay? So he'll take that on later on. But this, this becomes the official position of the empire. 
Christianity can go on. We're not going to say it's legal, but we're also not going to go after it unless I have a political agenda that causes me to do so. Okay. Um, in the midst of that, there is a guy named Ignatius. We already, uh, okay, we got to talk about Polycarp. Ignatius um, was a bishop. Um, he, pre he presided over Antioch. Uh, remember that one? That's a big deal. It's not just from the Holy Hand Grenade. Antioch becomes a very big deal in the church. Antioch and Alexandria and a couple other places. Okay, so keep that one in the back of your mind. He presided over Antioch. Uh, he defended against a number of heresies. A lot of his writings still exist. Well, not a lot. Some of his writings still exist. Um, he was, we don't know why, but he was accused of being a Christian. He was one of the leaders. Um, now, he was going to be killed. He was brought to Rome so he could be in the game. All right, thrown in the Colosseum. Um, while he was en route, he met with churches along the way. So he went from Antioch, which is kind of over near Israel, and he's going along the Mediterranean coast to Rome, Italy. Okay? And as, he, as they stop, Christians from those various areas are coming to meet him. And he's allowed to meet with them. And then as he gets back on his ship or covered wagon or whatever it is that he's going to Rome in, he writes letters to him. And these are some of his letters exist. And he starts talking about things like um, Christology. He says, there is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit, uh, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life and death, both of Mary and of God, first passable and then impassable, even Jesus Christ our Lord. So he starts talking about the dual nature of Christ. That's a big deal, guys. You'll find out next week. Um, he stresses the Eucharist as a means of grace. He talks about the Lord's Day replacing the Sabbath. Right? He was not Jewish. Um, he uses the term Catholic to mean that the church is universal. He starts stressing the need for a single bishop, a single church leader. I'm going to talk about why he did that. It's not just because he wanted the power struggle. Um, he reveals the attitude towards martyrdom, and this is a big deal. He views martyrdom as an opportunity in the flesh to simulate, to show his appreciation, to be thankful for what Christ did for him by walking through the same thing. Just as Christ was tortured, he wants to be tortured. It brings him closer to Christ. It gives him an opportunity to emulate Christ's passion. Does that make sense? So the Christians said, in Rome, said, we think we can get you off. He said, don't. I don't want you to get me off. I want to walk through this. I want to be martyred. I want to show and I want to share in that experience as I go to be with my Savior. That was his opinion of martyrdom. That's how he viewed it. Interesting. Let's talk Polycarp. Polycarp was a leader. He was a bishop of Smyrna. He was also supposedly a direct disciple of John, the, the Apostle John. Um, it, his story is captured in, in a book called uh, Martyrdom of Polycarp. Around 155 AD, persecution broke out in Smyrna, the same one from Revelation. Uh, Christians were accused um, but refused to recant, so they called for Polycarp. Um, now, what did Polycarp do? This is a big deal. Ignatius, what was his attitude towards persecution? Martyrdom. Bring it on. What did Polycarp do? Run and hide. I don't want to be persecuted. So his, his, he, his church tells him to, and he agrees, and so he starts hiding out, but then he gets found, so they move him again, and he gets found. Finally, he realizes, kind of like Nathan, I think, in the Old Testament, mm, maybe I have to do something here. So he finally just gives himself in, and at this point, from this point on, now he's sold for being a martyr in the same way that Ignatius was. Okay? So then he starts going through, and he's got some uh, some things that are just attri attributed to him that are awesome. Um, as he stands there, they're going to burn him at the stake, and the crowd starts yelling, down with the atheists. And so he starts pointing at all of them, saying, yeah, I agree, down with the atheists. And he starts pointing at the crowd. So now this guy is just done, right? He doesn't care about this world. He doesn't care about any of these people and what they think of him. So he says, um, 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. They ask him to recant. He says, how then can I blaspheme my king and savior? If you threaten me with a fire that burns for a season and after a little while is quenched, but you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. 
Um, so as he's burning at a stake, he says, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of the martyrs I may share the cup of Christ. That was his attitude towards martyrs. Okay? He went to the stake and considered it a privilege to die that way. Now, was he scared? Yeah, probably. Did it hurt? Probably. Right? I, I don't know. If God protected him, if whatever happens that way, but this man obviously sold out for Christ. Okay? And this was some of the attitude towards it. It was a privilege. It was an honor. It was something that we do and we are counted worthy of. And God it plans for us and we walk into it. Right? That was some of their attitude. Does that make sense? So let's establish some of the principles from that. What is martyrdom? Something that you choose or that's chosen for you? Chosen for you. And how are you chosen? Why was Ignatius chosen? Why was Polycarp chosen? Because he was accused of being heretic. And you were accused. So somebody found something in your life that was worthy of accusation. So Justin Martyr gets accused. He's defending. You stand up and you run over and say, I'm with this guy. Then you're condemned with him. What's wrong with you? Justin Martyr was accused. Were you? Yeah, but you're supporting the guy that's being accused. You're not going it's to not the point. Him. Are you rushing in? And are you trying to manipulate the situation by trying to throw yourself into martyrdom? Should you get the same benefits of martyrdom? Should we recognize you as a believer because you threw yourself into martyrdom? Mm. Other world systems have problems, don't they? Second, what did Polycarp do? Polycarp was considered almost an apostle. What did he do when he was called to martyrdom? He hid. And then later repented. What do I do with these guys? They backed down at the moment of need, and now they come back and they want to be part of the church. What the heck is this? What am I going to do with these guys? You see what the problems are starting to arise at? We're starting to figure out how we can deal with this. Um, Marcus Aurelius was another source of percussion. We're not going to talk about him. But you kind of see some of the issues that are starting to arise now. How do I deal with my martyrdom? How do I deal with these people? How do I deal with this doctrine? How do I deal with these rising? There's, there's actually multi-generations of people. There's a real culture that I have to uh, participate in. How do I deal with the Justin martyrs who are synchronizing? How do I deal with the Tatians who are trying to separate? And how do I deal with guys like Iranians who are trying to establish what is true doctrine in the first place? And how do I deal with the guys that are trying to be martyrs? And the guys that are martyrs. And the guys that don't want to be martyrs. This is some complicated stuff. And if you think you got it all put together, don't. This is complicated. It's complicated for them and it was complicated for us now. 